dealing with rejection where we're going to talk about the joys of being rejected. A lot, yeah. In the industry and outside the industry, it's just unavoidable. Um, I am Janella Angelis. I'm a YA fantasy writer who um, is rep by Tao Lee of the Sandra Dykstra Literary Agency. And I just recently um, signed with her, so my journey of rejection is just starting, I think. <laughs> um, and I'll have everyone else introduce themselves, um, who you are, what you're writing for. My name is Chelsea Sidoti, and my debut novel, The Hundred Lives of Lizzie Lovett, is coming out this January. I'm Toby Easton. Do you think these work? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Toby Easton. I'm the author of the Murr Chronicles series. Uh, the first book, Emerge, came out this spring. The next book, Submerge, comes out uh, next spring. And the third book, Emerge, will come out sometime after that. Um, it is about mermaids who live secretly on land. Hi, I'm Rashmi Chakshi. I'm the author of The Star Touch Queen, which is a Gaze and Persephone retelling with Hindu mythology. I have been rejected a lot, so I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Lindsay Cummings. I was just, sorry, I was taking my shoes off because I heard. Um, <laughs> did weird. you? Yeah, I noticed you were barefoot. I'm always like, barefoot. Okay, she's <laughs> got first. Um, and I'm the author of The Murder Complex, the Balance Keeper series, and most recently co author of Zenith. Sasha, and that's, yeah, that's about all I got. I'm Carly Weber, and I have my own literary agency, CK Weber Associates, um, and I, yes, I send a lot of rejections, but what a lot of authors are surprised to hear is that agents get rejected just as much as writers do, and maybe I'll talk about that a little later. Okay, well, let's just jump in and start at pretty much the beginning stages of rejection, where people usually get rejected in the clearing stages. So if anyone can recall or estimate a ballpark, how many rejections do you guys get during the clearing stage, um, either for the book that you got representation for or previous projects? I actually, I almost feel guilty about my querying process because it wasn't the long, drawn out, horrible thing that it was for most people. I actually, um, had only sent out one round of query letters and ended up getting an offer from my agent um, very, very quickly. And so, so it wasn't it wasn't agonizing. That part of it wasn't agonizing. Um, but I, the query process doesn't really start when you when you send out the query letters. I spent so much time doing research, and I had spreadsheet after spreadsheet, and I rewrote my query letter probably 50 different times, and was harassing everyone I knew about, you know, well, do you think this first line or this first line? <laughs> well, now, now let me pull the end line from this other one. And so, um, you know, and in that way, that entire, those weeks and weeks leading up when I was trying to prepare for query were terrible, and I was just living so much in my own head. Um, and so that's the part that I sort of shudder when I remember and hope that I never, ever have to go through again. And then actually sending the query letters turned out to be, like I said, fairly quick and easy. Um, so I had a lot of rejection, but it was kind of in a condensed period of time. Um, <laughs> what happened to me was I, um, I wrote the book and, um, and I got actually, I got some pre-query rejection, which was um, I won like a 20,000 word edit from, an edit from a freelance editor online, and I only entered to kind of get feedback on my query, because you did it based on your query, and then I won based on my query, because I worked like crazy on my query. Uh, again, sending it to like everybody, going like a million, should the line go here, should it go here, does it go, crazy. And so I used this contest to kind of judge it, and I won a free 20,000 word edit, and this editor told me it would never be published, told me librarians would never shelve it, told me, um, because it, like, it has some sexy moments, um, not, like, nothing goes beyond kissing, but there's a lot of like frank sexual discussion in my book. Mermaids keep their legs by thinking about sex because they get legs at puberty. Um, and so, thank you, and I feel like that either really appeals to people or they think I'm like the devil. Um, <laughs> literally, don't blow my good words. Um, and so um, I got this person was like, like brains are never going to shelve it. Schools will never stock it. Like this, like no publisher will take this. And um, and I was like freaking out. 
because um, this was the first, and she only looked at the first 20,000 words, I was like, oh my god. Um, and luckily, at the same time, I had gotten into Pitch Wars, again, because I worked like crazy on my quarry. Pitch Wars is a contest where published authors mentor um, like aspiring authors, writers, who are, I don't like the word aspiring, they're all writers. Um, so, yeah, published authors mentor uh, writers and kind of help them and tell them, you know, help them get their manuscript ready for agents. And um, I was selected for Pitch Wars, and I was mentored by the amazing Skylar Dorset, who everybody should check out for other World Series, because it rocks. And um, so, the, like, two days after I got that letter from the editor, Skylar was like, this book's totally ready for you to quarry. And I was like, what? Because I was expecting that phone call to just be, like, her bashing everything with that editor. And she was like, no, no, no. Like, it's completely ready to quarry. Like, I have, like, four notes, but they're personal. Like, send it, start sending it out. And so I have like a lot of rejection pre-query from that editor where I like my whole, like I flipped and I was like, oh my God, maybe like everybody thinks this. Um, and then I really, I did a lot of critical thinking with her notes and I took like one or two little things that I actually agreed with and I kind of, I had to know to like throw away the rest and be like, she just doesn't get this book. Um, and then I started, and then I had to start querying right away because I had pitch wars coming and I knew that if for some reason one of those agents was interested, I'd lose the chance to start querying a lot of other agents. So I had to send a lot of queries right away. And luckily I'd done a ton of research ahead of time and had like a list. Um, and so I maybe got between, I want to say 50 and 100 rejections um, from agents, um, but also like good interest. Um, <laughs> In, but it was short, it was two months. They were the longest two months of my entire life, but like looking back, two months is like not a long time. So I'm very grateful in retrospect for those excruciatingly long two months. Um, I think I got about 300 rejections altogether. A lot of them were addressed to Dear Author or Mr. Jokshi. We're gonna talk about, <laughs> gonna talk about why you get Dear Author rejections. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense, but I, yeah, they were really, really rough and I, Star Touch Queen was not the first project that I had queried. There were like others before, which were just like thinly veiled Twilight fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine too. And that was just for getting uh, representation. And I think I queried for about three months because it was the same thing. A bit shorter amount of time because there was a lot of research put into that query. Uh, but that was just a start. And then we went on submission. That's just a whole nother. Yeah. Just, I mean, yeah. I'm assuming that'll be another question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but if you want to know what it's like, it's like take your ego. And then go outside in that Las Vegas heat and then just scrape it against the asphalt. It's like that. Uh, it'll just burn you. So, so that was that. Yeah. yeah, I got actually a rejection the day before the Star Touch Green came. Dear Mr. Traction, it's hard. I got about 120 rejections from prayer letters. So I thought mine was like bad, but 300 wrong. Um, you don't have to show don't do that. I literally, like, I know it's 120 because I counted every single one. I like, hated life after that. Um, but that wasn't my first book, and I, I realize now that I made a mistake of querying too soon. I wasn't ready to send out those letters yet. Um, and so then when I started writing the Murder Complex, I actually went to a conference and pitched it to an agent before I'd even written it, which is like a huge no, don't do that. Um, but when I finally wrote the book, I sent it out to the agent, and finally, after a year of querying and getting all these rejections, I wrote a new book, sent it out, and the first one that read it like called me like two days later, and so I finally got that yes, and it was so exciting, and I was like, wait, is this like a joke? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to talk about why there are dear author rejections. Um, so I'm one person at my agency, so I, I know all the math. On average, I get 10 queries a day, and I'm open to queries 365 days a year. There's one of me. And I already have clients that I have to pay attention to. I have, I take 60 seconds with your query letter. And that's why it's so important to edit your query letter, to really make sure that you're presenting your main character, your plot, your problem right up front. Because seriously, agents, we just don't have the time to dedicate to unsolicited queries. And they're they're delightful to read in the way that I can find my next client that way. Um, and I have. I found almost all of my clients through unsolicited queries. Um, but I have I don't take paper queries because paper. Um, also because I work out of my home. Um, I have an email signature and what I do is I've got it set up in my email on my iPad and I sit in bed 
or I'm watching TV, going through my unsolicited query files, and the minute I see something in the query that makes me want to not read the book, I hit reply. The signature is already there. It says, dear author, and then there's something, you know, fairly professionally and gracious, you know, thank you for considering my agency, because I am really flattered that anyone would consider my agency. Um, but then, for whatever reason, I say this particular work is just not right for me. And I do, and then I say I wish you the best in your literary endeavors, which is actually true, because I do want writers to succeed, even if they're not a good fit for me. You know, it's like, there are good books that have been published that, like, I would have passed on Twilight. I didn't like it. I was, would have not have been, had I been agenting at the time, I would not have been the right agent for that book. I would have sent Stephanie Meyer a dear author letter. <laughs> and I, and I, but I still would have been able to do that, because you, as an agent, cannot take on books that you're not really passionate about. Um, and I'm not, I would not have passed on The Hunger Games, not in a million years. <laughs> um, but that's why, I mean, we, it's just really a matter of time and taste. And um, before I became an agent, I reviewed for Kirkus. And Kirkus, you have like a week and a half turnaround time on your reviews. Um, so Kirkus taught me to read fast and to read for what I like. So that experience gave me, I can look at a query and say, yes, this intrigues me, or no, it doesn't. And then I'll go on to the sample pages. I ask um, that you send me one page, or no, uh, query letter, a synopsis, and three sample chapters, or 30 pages, whichever is more. Because I say that I need 50 pages to know if a book is good, but I only need one to know if it's bad. <laughs> and so that's, that, and a, that's, that's why we get backed up in queries. Um, because even though we're excited about the possibility of finding new clients, I've got to talk to the client who's got, you know, questions about their contract or whatever. So that's, it has to be a fast process. Um, but that's also, that's why there's more than one agent in this world. There's 120 and they all hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate you. That's a really interesting perspective because I feel like I always hear more about rejection from the author, the writer side, I always think it's interesting to hear how agents themselves deal with rejection because they're not only rejecting, they also get rejected. All the time. So, yeah, multiple offers and like on sub. So I wanted to know probably what's your um, feeling rejection in return. Rejection from, so let's start with um, rejection for clients who I already represent and I have their books out. I've got books that I've not been able to sell for my clients and it is it, it is like having your ego beaten down because I have that feeling like, you know, do I not have good taste in books? Does this editor hate me? Um, and no, it's really, it is not personal. It's just this book wasn't a good match for this particular editor for whatever reason. Um, and some editors, some, a lot, because they're just as pressed for time as agents are, have been able to give good feedback um, just as an example, um, you know, I've been getting rejections lately for a book where editors have said, you know what, I, I'm not so into this plot, it was a mystery, I had it guessed by the halfway point of the book, but this author writes a really great YA voice, and I'd be interested in seeing the next project. So I've had some of that, um, and then somewhere it's like they send me a form rejection, and then I want to call them and be like, Come on, we, we talk on the phone, we're nice people, but can you please tell me a little more? And sometimes I will ask if they don't give a reason so that um, maybe in the future I can make a better match to the editor. Um, but it's really, you have to, because I feel bad about it too. Um, my rule is I only work with the best people um, and I'm passionate about the projects that I take on and send out. And really you just have to keep going forward. You just have to think onward and upward. It's that same thing, you know, you can only please some of the people some of the time. Um, and agenting is very much a business of matchmaking. Um, there are editors who, there are editors that I will go to automatically with everything, even if I think that it's a really long shot for that publisher, because I like the way this editor thinks, or I think that the imprint in general could be a good home for my author to produce future books. Um, and I'd rather take that long shot and maybe get a rejection that says, hey, not this book, but maybe the next one. Um, but I also, I don't necessarily, at least in my first round, I don't believe in the spaghetti theory. Like, I don't want to throw it at the wall and see if it sticks because this could be the publisher where my author builds a career. And I don't want my authors to have a career with just anybody. I want an editor who really gets the vision of the book. Um, and I'm going to embarrass one of my clients who's in the room right now. 
Um, she has a wonderful sci-fi retelling of Romeo and Juliet that took me a really long time to sell because it just didn't fit this out of the other editor. Then I queried an editor. Everybody's going to get a copy. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to buy it from Heather. Is it angel? I wish. Who is it? Who is it? So I, I queried one editor who said, you know, I see something here. I think the writing's good. Would she be willing to do this, that, and the other revision? It took a while. You know, we went back and forth with the editor. What do you want to see? What are you hoping to get out of this manuscript? Um, Heather did the revisions, and we sold the book. Um, it took a long time to make that match, but it was a great match. Um, and sometimes that's worth more than anything. I actually have a very like interesting rejection story from being on submission. With the murder complex, we sent it out to like we had like twenty something editors, twenty five editors reading, and we got twenty five rejections. And we were like, well, crap, like it's it's done. Um, and then like four months later, out of the blue, Harper Collins, who had like rejected us, actually came back, and we're like, hey, is the book still there? I'm like we think we screwed up, and we're like, oh, uh, sure, I guess. So even like that like soul crushing like my, everyone hates my book thing like actually turned into a book deal from someone who initially rejected me and then they're like, okay, we screwed up, we're sorry. Um, so that was something really wacky that I didn't think was like a thing. <laughs> but I'm real grateful for that thing. Um, okay, so I kind of want to take it in a different direction that I think a lot of people are curious about um, because querying, being rejected, being on sub is a very disheartening process. So I want to know what were your rituals for dealing with rejections and kind of developing that thicker skin that really helps you survive in this kind of business? Um, so for me, I was, I had like a similar sort of rejection story, but nobody came back. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was like 20 rejections all at once. It was my first year of law school too. So oh. I was sad, full of sad. And <laughs> If there was anything that really inspired me the most, it was watching documentaries. I it was like the first time that Chef's Table had come out on Netflix. I don't know if anybody's watched that, but it is beautiful and moving, and there's food, which is perfect. <laughs> and sometimes you really need to look at other people's failures, the people that you admire, and remind yourself that you are not alone in this at all. And if you have to curl up in bed and watch like YouTube cat videos. Like, you do that, you just do it, it's fine. Um, but yeah, that was really, really rough. I and mean, there were some days I honestly just could not get out of bed because it, that doubt will just drive you to, to not be able to write even. You, know, yeah. you just feel like your creativity is, is stunted because you think that this rejection is a reflection of the talent. And like what Carly was saying, I mean, that's not necessarily the case, it's just about the right match. It's not you, it's me, it's a cliche breakup line, but it's true, too. Sometimes we're just not that into it. Yeah. <laughs> You're really cute, but you know. <laughs> I also think, I was talking about this in the last panel, but like something I've learned over the past like four or five years of like being in publishing is that like I'm very passionate about my books and my work, but they do not give me self-worth. No matter, like, I don't care if I get a thousand rejections, I'm not going to stop believing in myself, and I'm not going to stop believing in my craft. I might try and work harder to get better at my craft, but just because my stuff might not do as well as someone else's doesn't mean that I'm not good enough. So, I mean, and it doesn't mean your agent will hate you either. No, not at all. That means I want to like lift you up and hug you and then work harder than you again to make it better. Yeah, one of the things I said for those who may not have been able to attend the agent panel, when you do have an agent and you're querying, your agent is not always able to sell your first book. Um, but we, our philosophy is that, at least mine, and I, I think the agents here would agree with me, we represent authors, not books. So I had more than one store, more than one client whose second book I sold, even though I couldn't sell the first book. So you do really just have to keep going, and your agent will be is always team you because if we didn't love you, we never would have signed you. Yeah, and I'll add. So we we're trying to say kind of uh, how we got that thick skin. So I was a little bit luckier in that I came from show a show business background. Oh. So I came from like a lot of rejection, and I was kind of used to that, and I was used to like the in your face rejection. So like email was a little bit of a relief, <laughs> um, which is kind of nice. Um, but I had a little bit of a thicker skin going in, I think. Um, 
but also in terms of like how I dealt with it, I think a lot of people tell you like you've got to be writing um, and like make sure you're writing. And I agree and disagree with that. I feel like while I was on submission, yes, it's the only way I got through it because you have like a, like a lot of time. Um, when I was pouring agents, I felt like it was almost a full-time job and I was also working at the time. Um, and so I felt like, because I personalized every single query letter by like reading, if I was going to send it to an agent, I read like every blog interview I could get my hands on first that they'd done with like what they wanted and you know, and were they the right fit and stuff like that. So for me, I felt like pouring and maybe that's why it was like a truncated process, but like those two months and the months leading up to them when I was like doing my research felt very much like a full-time job. Um, and so maybe that is also why the writing, why the rejections kind of stung, because like that's all I was doing, and I don't know if I would recommend that, but I feel like it also helped in that if I got one, I sent one. So like I would get a rejection, and I would be like, okay, who's next on the list? Like I, this one's down, like that's, and I tried to think of each one as like another step closer to the yes. I was like, okay, like this one said no, so that just means like I'm closer to finding the one that will say yes. It's um, actually very, very similar to to my process. It's it's almost superstitious where, okay, so no one, um, some people, but most of us, you don't get a yes the first time, whether it's looking for an agent or when you're actually on submission, you're going to get lots of no's before you get yeses, which means that when you start sending out, you know, letters or when your manuscript goes on submission, until you get that first no, you can't get a yes because it's just unlikely that it's going to happen. So, so basically, every time I got a rejection, I just told myself that, you know, okay, well, now that I've had some rejections, this is good because this means maybe I'll actually get published. Yeah, and I actually, <laughs> I actually have a rejection that I love um, from Susie Townsend, who's here, and I told her this yesterday to her face, and I was like, I, I really loved your rejection. Like, thank you so much. And I think she thought it was going to, like, because they get so much, like, hate mail for their rejections. Oh, and, God. And, <laughs> but I said it, and I was like, I promise this is not enough. And I wanted to like actually genuinely thank you um, because it was one of my first rejections and it was a form letter, like a dear author form letter, but she added the sentence, mermaids just really creep me out. <laughs> <laughs> and I got it when I was really early on in the query process and I was like, okay, this wasn't the query. Like it wasn't my writing, it wasn't the sample pages. Yeah, she just wasn't hates mermaids. No, <laughs> I bet this is going to be true for so many of the rejections I get, but they won't add that line. So then, like, every time I got a rejection, I was like, maybe mermaids just really creep them out. <laughs> and it was like, I can't tell you how helpful that one rejection was. So sometimes I feel like a nugget of something that just makes you feel good. <laughs> Susie is my agent, by the way, and she is awesome. Yeah, she's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, she's awesome. I told her yesterday, and she's like, they do really creep me out. <laughs> I've never heard her say that before, because, you know, when I stopped her before I saw her, I was reading every interview she's ever done, I actually saw the show. Yeah, see, I didn't, I, I, do. I think it must have been after. My powers are better than yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you her later. That could also be. Maybe you scarred her. Maybe I scarred her. <laughs> it was your one. <laughs> I got a rejection letter that said, Dear Catherine. I was like, my name's Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> There's an agent in Canada named Carly Waters. Um, we get a lot of her email. <laughs> And she writes nonfiction, which I don't, and I'm like, I don't know whether to tell, like, did the author do this on purpose because they're just not doing their homework, or should I forward this to Carly? <laughs> <laughs> about 
how much magic goes into the realism. Um, and he's and he's like leaving my table after I tell him no. And he said, well, you know, Paulo Polo had he had a lot of he did really well with the Alchemist, which is similar to my book. And I looked at this author. I was so crabby at the end of the day because it was like hour three and a half. And I just looked at him and I said, good for him. <laughs> Um, yeah, people who basically, most of the hate mail um, is, you're wrong and you suck as an agent. Um, but I also, I will say too, um, for people who, if you are correct, if you get a rejection, even if it's nice, do not write to us to say thank you. I mean, I, I appreciate good manners as much as the next person, but the problem is, I actually have my email set up so that all of my queries go into a separate file folder. I don't, they don't even come into my inbox because I need to reserve the inbox for clients and editors. Um, so basically they just stack everything up. It's like, we're, you know, we appreciate nice manners, but you just have to move on. Um, I get all kinds of crazy, one I got from a guy in prison who sent me a nude photo of himself. Um, <laughs> I think Susie may have been the one that had like, they, like her agency was threatened by some guy and like she had the FBI on it. Uh, yeah, uh, was it Susie? I don't know, but oh. I don't know that's worried. So yeah, and I never post my address anywhere because I work out of my home and I only take email queries. Um, but when I worked at uh, Writer's House, we had people coming to the front door of the building with their queries. Don't query in person unless you're at a writer's conference. Don't pitch on Twitter. Um, unless it's a pitch session, in which case, yes, bring it. I actually, I signed a client from uh, Pitch Madness, so I'm all for that, but otherwise, no. Um, yeah, you just have to sad face and move on. Go watch a cat video. Yeah. Mr. Sahal, there's a cute So it's been interesting hearing all of your stories of rejection kind of, you know, weave in and out of like querying and on submission, I kind of wanted to talk about like the other forms of rejection after that process, such as not getting into bookstores or not getting trade reviews or poor reviews. Um, how do you deal with those other forms of rejection? Well, I don't have to pay attention. Yeah, I was just going to say, my book isn't out yet, so most of those things I haven't yet worried about, but as soon as advanced copies started going out into the world, I have nothing to do with Goodreads. I, I just don't need that in my life. I have a wonderful friend who goes and looks for me and will send me good reviews, and that way I don't need to go see anything terrible and, and get depressed about it. Yeah, I learned the hard way not to look at Goodreads after your book comes out. But especially when it comes to professional like trade reviews and other stuff, you've, you, know, you have to remember that it is still one person. Even if they are speaking on behalf of an organization, it's still one person. Most of these trade reviews, I mean, they're professional about it. They're they're listing the synopsis or and whatever else and their take on it. But it does not define you. It does not stop you from writing something better the next time. And even if it stings, I've had ones that totally stung. And I'm just sitting there fuming and I'm thinking like, you just misread it. You didn't understand it. But it, what it's okay. It is what it is. I think to, at a certain point when you write something and you put it out in the world. You have to let it go. And you can sing that song as much as you want to, because it's a good reminder. You, you've invested something in this, and now it's up for everybody else to interpret it and for it to mean something to them or not to mean anything at all. But it's not your responsibility to make sure that the stranger across the room is going to love your book. You just have to love your own work. So, but I mean, everybody deals with that, and it's, it's hard, but. Yeah, for, for the longest time, like, Almost a full year after my debut came out, I was on Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes & Noble, I mean daily, checking it, looking at like the newest reviews first so I wouldn't miss any of them. And it got me to this point where I was like, my creativity was like stunted because I was so afraid of what everyone else was saying. Um, and every time I got like a three star, I'd be like, why is it not like a three and a half or a four? Um, but now I realize I literally don't care. Like I love when people love my work, but if they don't like it, I don't care because I do. And and it makes me happy to write and it gives me something to do with my life other than like sit around in my underwear eating hot cheetos. <laughs> I just don't care and I think that's something that like I'm so grateful for that I've come to that point. And I feel like if every writer can get to the point where they literally don't give a crap. 
craft, then it's wonderful. And if you can just sit back and create and, and just enjoy your art, I mean, that's your thing, that's a piece of you. So just love your art because it's yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say like, like jealous I am of that. Like I want to get to that stage so badly, guys. My book came out in April. And I'm just starting to get to the place where like I'm not checking reviews daily and then I'll like I'll do be really really good for a while and then I'm not. And then it's like 2 a.m. And you're oh, like, yeah. so, like, <laughs> I'll be like, I left you a five-star review, go read it. And then you see like the review under it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with all the chips and oh. you're, and like but they're funny and you wanna laugh, but then they're laughing at me. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, wait. Or like they can like misquote pieces and like really analyze those pieces. Oh god guys. Um but uh, I will, I'm getting progressively better. I think like the more time after it's out, you start to care less and I'm trying to do that. And I also, um, I've heard what really helps, I haven't really done it much, is go and read the one star reviews of books yes. you love. Yes. Like yes. pick a book you love and go read the one star reviews. And only please some of the people some of the time. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. That's exactly um, what you do is write the best book that you know how. Right. And there's gonna be people that don't think that's good enough, but that doesn't matter. If you've done your best, then you should be proud of yourself for that, whether or not you've got people criticizing, you know, your book on Amazon or wherever. And I've also something. Oh, it's something else. Oh, two things. Uh, tell, tell two stories. Number one, a very important thing to remember is that no matter how many one-star reviews your book gets, your publisher will never make you return your advance. <laughs> so you know, uh, you can you can cry on your way to the bank. Um, and second. There can be a, such a huge disparity, even among the few professional journals, and I'll tell the story. I have a, a client who's a professional tough guy. He's a DEA agent, has been for 20 years. His debut novel just came out in June. I love him, his publisher loves him. Kirkus hated, capital H, hated his book. They just trashed it, and he was so, and like this professional tough guy who was so upset he didn't write for a week after the Kirkus review came out, and I said, to, and he's like, is my publisher not going to buy my next book because of this review? And I was like, no, they love you. They love the ideas you've put forth. This is one review. Every publisher, every agent is used to getting terrible purpose reviews for their clients. And I may have written a couple of them in the past. Um, <laughs> but I also but I also wrote star reviews. You know, I try to be fair and just deal with the book in front of me. Um, so while he was down in the dumps about purpose, he sent an email and said, so I just, got a, uh, I just got asked to do an interview for Publishers Weekly, is that good? And I said, that means you're getting a star from Publishers Weekly. He got a star and a boxed interview from PW. Wow. So I, we can't predict this. One, one person is going to love it, one person is not going to love it. But he, he said, you know what, I'm still really proud of the book I turned in. And his publisher and I are really proud of the book he turned in. He just got a film agent, so hopefully, maybe we'll see a TV series out of that. But even if you're a professional tough guy, it is okay. Like, and I, I hate people who say, oh, don't feel bad. Feel bad, it's okay. It, it, but don't, you can't <coughs> dwell on it for too long. Yes. You just have to keep moving forward. Yeah. The publishing industry is hard enough. And just take every win for what it is. I always get bad reviews from Kirkus, and I always get good reviews from Publishers Weekly or from School Library Journal. But I'm convinced that it's just one person at Kirkus that's like just a really bitter Hufflepuff or something. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so much shame. So much slurring. You all know who reviews for Kirkus, right? But who writes for these professional journals? Kirkus's staff is 100% librarians because librarians do not have invested investments in publishing houses. Um, they're paid to review by Kirkus for the book. So, um, and when I started agenting, I dropped out of reviewing because I felt that um, I couldn't be impartial anymore. So those reviews are written by, um, by librarians. PW employs other industry professionals, I think some other writers and things like that, but do understand too that when those reviews come out, not Goodreads obviously, but the professional reviews are written by people who are professionally impartial. And I'll also add that sometimes those really good reviews, especially if they come in person, so I'm just at the stage where I'm starting to like meet people who have read the book, um, really like let them outshine the negative ones because yeah. like the negative ones generally come from like Goodreads 
trolls who like do this because don't forget that like Goodreads is a social media platform and a popularity contest, and more people like the snarky reviews because they're yeah, funny. Yeah. So they like, will always rise. To the top yeah, it's it's off. It's like not about you or your book, but like I did a, a my first Barnes and Noble signing recently where like there was a 12 year old girl who had read my book that week because she knew I was coming to her Barnes and Noble and like showed up at 11 a.m. To like, and she was like, I'm your groupie. And, it, <laughs> and, then, and I turned to my husband and I was like, if nobody else comes here for like the next four hours, because I had to sign it. I was like, if nobody else comes here the next four hours, like this was worth it. And like, so I try to remember like that girl <laughs> when I see something that I don't want to see. Um, because like, if there's like, a, like, even if there's just like a handful of people who love it that much, um, like that's worth it and there's going to be those people. Like there's going to be people who love it as much as you do, as much as your agent does, as much as your editor does, and like try to remember that. Like all those agents who rejected it, there's going to be people who also don't feel that strongly about it, right, when they read it. And all those editors who rejected it, there's going to be readers who don't feel that strongly about it just like those, but there's going to be the people like your editor and like your agent who just fall in love with it. And it's about like hearing those people and letting their voices be kind of like louder. And I think it helps that you're picking up people the whole way. I don't know if I've written something good or terrible because my mom's the only person who's read it and she's going to love it. But then you get your agent, and so you have an agent behind you. And so when you're on submission, you know, during those low points, you've got someone there saying, this is what I do professionally. I am, it is if not in my best interest to lie to you about loving this book. They love it, and they're telling you the truth. And then you have your editor, and then there's other people, the publisher, and then once it's out there, you start to have fans who love it. And so the whole time, I think that as you, there's always going to be rejection, no matter what, you know, in writing and in life, that's just the way it is. But as you get farther along the writing process, I think it gets easier every step of the way. And fun fact, usually, um, if you're published by any kind of traditional house, large or small, on average, by the time your book goes into ARCs or, or galleys, 75 people have read it and believed in it. Because it's your, your agent, your editor, the marketing team, the sales team, the school and library marketing people. You've got a, a team of people who think your book is really valuable even before it's available for review to anyone. <laughs> yeah, if you get a book deal, like, not an accident. It's not, it doesn't like your book is good enough. Doesn't it? I wish I could make book deals by accident. But it's hard. Like it's hard to remember those things sometimes. Like even like I I wrote a book and sent it to my editor and they were like we love you but we just don't feel like we want this book right now and that was really hard because I was like didn't you like why like we've done books together and like that was rejection beyond publication still but. They still like are invested in helping me, and like you're always going to get rejection, but you have to remember that, that people still support you, and you wouldn't have gotten that book deal in the first place if all these people didn't like it. Like they aren't going to hire you on as an author if they hate your work, and they know that there's going to be people that aren't going to like it, but they still bought it anyways. So you have to always keep that in the back of your mind that like you're good enough, and just forget the rest. That's a wonderful note to end on. Uh, I wanted to open up for Q&A, um, have some time for that if people had questions for these lovely panelists. Yes. So I'm coming from a science background and when, like, as far as publication for science goes, you submit it and um, then you have reviewers who, you know, like tear it apart and you have to rewrite a lot of it, and so you can um, submit again with minor revisions, major revisions, all this kind of stuff. So how often do you submit something and somebody sees some kernel and then they're like, change everything, but it's like how, like, how do you get to that point and how do you know if that's really the right path for you versus keeping with the book that you queried? Does that make sense? Either in query or submission. Um, so actually that's, that's, very similar to what happened with my submission story. After doing tons of rewrites, rejected by like 20 plus editors, um, we went on submission in October and the book sold in March. That's a very long time to be on submission. And in February, I'm sure I'm, many of you have heard me say this already, but I rewrote the story touch screen. I, I threw everything out. And I think that rejection, you shouldn't ignore it, even if it hurts or stings, uh, but let it open up a new perspective for you. I think that's what you're talking about with peer review and science journals and everything. Um, and the way that I chose to rewrite is just you have to be honest with yourself. And I say this all the time. You have to honor the book that you wanted to write. 
When you have rested that manuscript for enough time, and you come back, and it's not what you wanted it to be, don't be lazy. If you gotta tear apart your wrist to redo it, to honor that book, you better do it. Because it does not matter. Now you can wallow in the rejections, but you have to move forward, and you've gotta channel it into something. And that was really, really hard, and it's, so scary to take that risk with your work, knowing that it could just lead to more rejections. But even if that happens, and even if it doesn't sell, it's not a failure. I mean, what Lindsay was saying, you write for yourself. You're not writing for the stranger, you're not writing for your fans, you're writing for you. So just remember that. Yeah, when I got my first revision letter from my editor, she like, it was like one paragraph about the things that she liked about it, and then like clearly <coughs> me in this single space to not like all that was awful. <laughs> and that felt like rejection as well, because I was like, why did you even buy this book if you hate it so much? <laughs> um, but I like stepped away from that for a while, and when it came back, I realized like she's just trying to help me. And, if, and yeah. I could see it with different <laughs> eyes when I, when I came back and looked at it. And I had to add 50,000 words. And then I got another letter saying, this is great, but now I want you to cut 30. Um, and, I it, and I was like, are you why don't you just kill me? <laughs> Is 
question that you might want to share that was like extra funny or you know you had like a good experience with kind of like what you said about Susie? I'll show, I'll show the disparity. Like when I was actually on sub, the rejections that I got from editors literally in the same day, I got one rejection from like an editor at a major publisher telling me it was too old for YA and another who told me it was too young for YA uh, in the same day. So I feel like stuff like that kind of makes you feel a little bit better uh, because you're like, I mean, it, it's also horrible because you're in the thick of it and you're like, what do they want? Um, but it's also like, well, okay, it's personal taste because it clearly can't both be too old for YA and too young for YA. So clearly, like that's somebody's personal taste, or it's what their house is looking for at the moment. I got another one where the editor literally wrote to my agent because I get my agent forwards me all the rejection letters, um, which is tough. But I like to be in the loop. That's not for everybody, but that's for me. I do that for all my clients. Yeah, I, I like to know what's happening. It would drive me crazy if I didn't know. Yeah, I, mean, I have friends who are like, you know, I'll just wait until the end of the month, and then you can just sort of tell summarize. Me yeah. Know. Everybody's different. But yeah, so I got one where the editor emailed my agent and said, like, I stayed up all night reading this book. I fell in love with it. It reminded me of like my childhood reading Hans Christian Anderson. I can't take it because it's not what we're looking for like on our on our list right now. Mm -hmm. And like I'm interested in her future, like she's sending her next stuff. Um, and that was like such a beautiful, lovely rejection. Um, and like so punch in the stomach at the same time. Um, but yeah, so I feel like you get these kind of mixed because submission is very different than pouring and that you get feedback. Um, but like, do with that feedback what you will. Sometimes you really need to take it, um, like Rosh was saying. But sometimes um, you just have to like understand that it's subjective. And my agent was really good at being like, it's personal taste. Like, yeah. go write something. <laughs> the agent's always going to be great at interpreting that rejection, and that is so important. But when I was querying stuff, I was like 15. I could like build Twilight fanfic, and I just could not find anything about how like long a book should be. And so one of my first googling whatever is I came across the number forty thousand. So that's my book. And um, I married that, and a very very kind agent was like, that, "That's not a book. So <laughs> it's forty thousand words of not a book." So I will say that the murder complex sold at fifty thousand words, really? which is pretty short. What? So, but then they maybe add that, uh, yeah. and then take some out. <laughs> I think mean, like, a lot of great stories. You obviously did. No, it was so bad. I don't know how it sold. <laughs>